Tonight we are very happy to have with us back the inimitable Joe Hill and the fireman. <laughs> the fireman. But we also have a very, very special guest to introduce Mr. Hill this evening. His name is Aaron Curtis. He's not only our quartermaster extraordinaire. You see all these books around the store. At some point or another, Aaron has ordered just about every single one of these books for you. Aaron is also an author and a blogger who has had a column called Book Junkie in Moxie Magazine and also wrote for the Miami blog collective The Heat Lightning. He's published essays in the Sun Sentinel's City Link Magazine, World Book Night's first ebook, and the collection Badass Lip Service True Stories. He was on Indie Bound's Indie Introduced debut author program and is currently on American Booksellers Association panel for the Revisit and Rediscover Backlist Initiative. You can find his writing online at Coral Gables Love and his own personal blog, Sweet with Fall and Fish. Please give him a warm welcome, Mr. Aaron Curtis. Thanks, Steve, for that introduction. I need an introduction, right? But, you know, I think I do. Like, Joe Hill doesn't. You know, like, you, you know who he is. I'm like that part of the book where, where you get a book, it's got an intro in it. You skip so that you can start the story. You know, oh, well, that's good. I usually read them, too. But if you're the type of person that skips, then, um, you know, you can skip over me. But... Um, you know what he's done because you've read it. You don't need to know about the awards. You don't need to know about the Eisner or the Bram Stoker or the fellowship, the Bradbury Fellowship. You know all that. So what I'm going to try to do is do what the best introductions do, which is to validate your life choices. <laughs> because I love Joe Hill's work as much as you do. And if it doesn't go well, well, then he'll be right up. And um, if you're watching later at home, you can just... Fast forward right over me. <laughs> I've always loved a good scare. And I blame my brother and my sister who snuck me into the theater to see Halloween when I was six years old. <laughs> I, say, I say snuck, but uh, it was the 70s. It was, a, it was a different time. They look at my brother. They're like, what, how old are you, 14? Yeah, go rain it. That's fine. <laughs> Only seven people get stabbed to death. You're good. So, I'm six years old, I'm sitting next to my teenage sister, and I'm watching six-year-old Mike Myers stab his teenage sister to death. <laughs> and that was the opening scene, so there was still the whole rest of the movie to go. And this started a lifelong fascination with horror for me. And I've watched and I've read a lot of horror over the years, but 20th Century Ghosts just blew me away. And it's one of those collections that is so good, you finish it and you're like, yes, whatever this guy does, I, I'm in. You just know you're a fan for life. And then Heart Shaped Box came along, and then Horns, and I'm like, oh, yeah, man, bring it on. I mean, it's, it's scary, but I'm a grown-ass man. I'm not, you know, I'm not six. I'm, I'm fine. Then Nosferatu comes out. And I, the last time you were here was not for an author event. You were meeting in the courtyard with uh, Gabriel Rodriguez. Yeah. Remember to go over. Yeah, yeah. I, t I told you this story. But I read Nosferatu visiting my family in Syracuse for Christmas <laughs> during a blizzard. <laughs> so Charlie Manx has his mind bridge. Vic McQueen has her mind bridge. And Joe Hill has Nosferatu, which is his mind bridge, so he can drop Charlie Manx and a bunch of just terrifying children right into your brain. I had nightmares so hard that I woke up, I woke up my mom. <laughs> like a six-year-old. Well, Fireman is a lot hotter than that book, but you know, I don't have anything to worry about now because I live in Miami where we don't have to worry about the heat <laughs> but so I hope this is validated your life choices because if you are here for creativity and fun and scares and imagination you have come to the right place because Joe Hill is here please help me give him a warm welcome hey. thanks so much thank you that works yeah okay cool you guys can all hear me 
pretty well? Yes, sir. Well, you've all been plunged right into the dark, which is where I like you. <laughs> um, I thought I would read a chunk of the new book, then we would have a musical interlude. Um, yep, musical interlude, and then, and then we'd do some questions. Um, uh, so, but let me start with a piece of the new story, um, and it's, this, is a, this is a chunk from the middle of the book, um, and uh, I've got something to set it up for you so you know what's happening, um, and without further ado, let's go for it. An incurable spore called Dragon Scale has raced through the nation, an unlikely infection that kills by spontaneous combustion. As the plague takes hold, hospitals burn and neighborhoods go up in smoke. The charred dead are everywhere. Infected and pregnant, Nurse Harper Willows has found refuge in Camp Wyndham, where a small community of the contaminated have learned how to suppress the disease. When they all sing together, or share in some other happy group experience, the dragon scale on their bodies lights up, glows like fluorescent paint, and delivers a sort of natural high. No one in this place of shelter burns to death. But in the darkest days of February, Wyndham has become a grim, toxic place. The elected head of camp, Mother Carol, is increasingly paranoid, haunted by threats real and imaginary. She is even come to fear John Rookwood, the fireman, an almost legendary hero to the ill. Those who cross Mother Carol are pressured to carry a stone in their mouths as a form of penance. Harper herself has shown a flagrant disregard for Carol's authority, but has refused to properly atone. In the scene that follows, she has just left a meeting with Carol, where she made it clear she views the new punishments as cruel and unhealthy. Convinced things are going bad, Harper is now on her way to see John to seek his advice and to warn him of the danger growing around them. Harper followed a barely discernible path beneath an obscure sky. Whichever way she turned her face, snow blew into it. The wind gusted, a tree cracked. Boards wobbled and flexed underfoot, requiring her to proceed slowly to keep her balance. When the House of the Black Star was out of sight behind her, she held up in the frozen, pine-scented dark. In another two hundred steps, she would cross the trail that wound down through the trees to the shingle and the dock. She could be across the water to the fireman's island in ten minutes, tell him what Carol had decided, warn him that a child ran through the pines to her right, a flickering shadow shape, and she turned her head to look and saw that it wasn't a child at all, only a skein of snow fleeing through the trees. Whack! A snowball hit her in the side of her head, but she didn't know it until she had gone another two steps. It took that long to register. She was not aware of reeling to one side or her right knee giving out under her until she found herself kneeling in the snow. Harper saw a blur of motion from the corner of her eye and raised an elbow in time to block the next snowball. The impact deadened her arm. A ringing shock jolted from elbow to hand. The snowball shattered the moment it struck her. The speckled white stone that had been packed in its center rolled out onto the snow in front of her. Girl shapes jumped from behind trees on either side of her, breathless with laughter. Harper thought she saw a snowball sailing at her stomach and dropped her arms to cover it, and it hit the side of her neck instead, a sharp sting, followed by numbness. They circled. The water in her eyes wanted to turn to ice, freeze there, the faces surrounding her were stiff and white and inexpressive, as if she were being attacked by department store mannequins. One of them charged at her back and shoved her. She toppled onto her side. Please be careful, she said. I'm pregnant. I'm not fighting you. Whitewash! Whitewash! sang someone who sounded horribly like 11-year-old Emily Waterman. Someone grabbed her hair in one gloved hand, picked up a fistful of snow in the other, and scrubbed her face with it. A girl shrieked with laughter. When Harper blinked away the snow, Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones was crouched before her. <laughs> he looked at her with a blank-eyed incredulity, a cheap plastic mask. He, no she, it was a girl behind that mask, held out a hand, palm up. A flat white stone rested in it. Eat it, came the voice from behind the mask. 
Eat it, bitch. Make her eat it, another girl in another mask said. They were all masked. Eat it, eat it, eat it, girls chanted. Harper was on her side in the snow, one arm covering the ripe swell of her belly, the other arm trapped under her body. The girl holding her hair yanked. Then she yanked harder. Harper opened her mouth and held it open like a child letting a doctor examine her tonsils. Tyrion Lannister forced in the stone, a cool, flat weight. There was a sound like someone ripping a bedsheet in half. The hand clutching her hair yanked, pulling Harper's chin up, forcing her head back. Another hand slapped her in the mouth, hard. A thumb moved back and forth, pressing the strip of duct tape flat across her lips. Half an hour, said the girl who had her by the hair. It stays in for half an hour. Now get up, get on your knees. Harper was lifted onto her knees. The girls pulled her arms behind her and there was another ripping sound while one of them tore off a fresh length of duct tape and bound her wrist together. Baby, Harper said, meaning be careful of the baby. She had no idea if anyone understood her. Two girls danced together, holding hands, twisting and spinning each other. One wore a Hillary Clinton mask, the other a Donald Trump face. <laughs> Flashlights played across the pines, a swarm of bright gold lights. Harper had to look again before she realized none of the girls were holding flashlights. It was the girls themselves, leaping about, laughing, kicking snow at her. They were lit up, like in church when they sang together. They shone for each other, the dragon scale throbbing, intense enough to cast a brightness from under their jackets, up around their open collars. So there were other ways to enter the exalted state of the bright. A chorus, or a firing squad, Either would serve to satisfy the scale. Harper heard the snicker-snack of scissors. Her gold hair began to fall in the snow. Ha ha, ha ha, said the smallest of her attackers, the girl she was sure was Emily Waterman. Cut it off, cut it all off. Her voice was a drunken bray. The wind sighed reluctantly, like a lover who realizes it's time to go. Her hair fell around her while the scissors went snickety-snack. The girl who had been clipping her hair said, isn't it sexy, the way the scissors sound? She opened and closed them next to Harper's ear. Gives me shivers. I like cutting your hair so much, I'm sorry there's not more of it. I'm sorry I have to stop. Maybe next time I'll cut something else. You need to decide if you're with us or against us, if you're going to shine with us or not shine at all. You want my medical advice, nurse? I prescribe a change in your bitchy attitude. Harper thought there was a chance that soon one of them would haul back and kick her belly like a football, just for the fun of it. They didn't know what they were doing anymore. Maybe they had already gone much further than they had intended. Maybe they had just meant to pelt her with snowballs and run. They had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten their own names, the voices of their mothers, the faces of their fathers. She thought it was very possible they would kill her here in the snow without meaning to. Use that pair of scissors to open her throat. When you were in the bright, everything felt good. Everything felt right. You didn't walk. You danced. The world pulsed with secret song, and you were the star of your own technicolor musical. The blood leaping from her carotid artery would be as beautiful to them as a sparkler throwing a burning red shower of phosphorus. The girl who had been standing behind her all this time pushed her onto her side in the snow, a bubble of some powerful, Dangerous emotion quivered inside her, and Harper remained very still so it would not burst. She did not want to find out what it was, whether it was grief, terror, or worst of all, surrender. Each of the girls took turns dancing up to her and kicking snow on her face, and Harper closed her eyes. The girls stood over her, whispering. Harper couldn't bear to look at them, to see that circle of masked faces gathered around her. They talked on and on in soft, hissing, unintelligible voices. Harper shivered violently. Her jeans were soaked and her wrists hurt, and her face was raw and burnt from all the snow that had been thrown in it. At last she opened her eyes at a squint. The whispering continued, but the girls were gone. The only thing talking was the wind, shushing the pines. She wriggled and twisted her wrists. The tape was on her gloves, not her skin, and in a while she was able to squirm one hand free. Harper pulled off the other glove and tossed them both aside, still stuck together with duct tape. 
She did not hesitate, did not give herself time to think, but found the edge of the duct tape over her mouth and ripped it off. She tore away some of her upper lip with it. Harper spat the stone into the snow. It was pink with blood. She got so lightheaded when she stood up, she had to put a hand against a pine to steady herself. She made her way from trunk to trunk, like a wobbly toddler taking her first steps and using the furniture to steady herself. She found the turning to the waterfront and started down the hill. The thought was in her to get to the fireman, tell him what had happened to her, what was happening to camp. Maybe, even now, it was not too late to pull things back on course, to make Camp Wyndham well again. She got perhaps twelve steps when someone called out to her. Nurse Willows, Nelson Heinrich shouted. Where are you going? The path to the infirmary is up here. He stood on the boards with Jamie close. Jamie was dressed in the same clothes she had been wearing the last time Harper saw her, the blaze orange snow pants and the puffy slate-colored parka. The only thing different was that she had taken off her Tyrion Lannister mask. That snow is up to your neck. Why don't you come back here before you're buried alive? Nelson's face was scrubbed red from the cold, and he grinned to show his two front teeth. Harper's breath steamed. When she licked her upper lip, she tasted blood. It took her almost five minutes to trudge the twenty steps back to the boards, wading waist-deep in the snow, powder getting inside her boots. Jamie and I were just off to relieve the lookouts at Mother Carol's. Good thing we showed up when we did. You were all turned around. He reached out with both hands to help her up onto the planks. Nelson frowned, but his eyes were gay with amusement. Look at all these tracks. We have rules, you know. No stepping off the paths. What if a hunter wandered by and saw all the tracks you've made? By God, if we were discovered, they'd ship us all off to Concord. If they didn't just shoot us right here. Wandering puts the whole camp in peril. Mr. Patchett and Mother Carol have been very clear about that. One hour with a stone should remind you of your responsibilities. Jamie Close stepped around him, holding out a white stone in her palm. She grinned to show a chipped tooth. Harper took the rock and obediently put it in her mouth. I wish I could say things got better for Harper after that, but they don't. My, wasn't that sunny? <laughs> um, one of the things the book does, it, does it, it covers a lot of thematic territory and a lot of subjects, but one of the things it does explore is community and how it can, be, can build you up or how it can tear you down. Um, and, and when Harper actually got to Camp Wyndham initially, it was a really wonderful place. And, and especially for the sick, the people who are contaminated with dragon scale, the experience of singing together lifts them up into an almost transcendental space where they feel like they've lost their own identity and they're all sharing each other's joy. Um, and I thought after reading such a gloomy portion, we might need to cheer up. And maybe, maybe we could reach for the bright with a big group sing-along. Um, <laughs> if it doesn't go well, if it turns into a complete and total catastrophe, that will also be keeping with the themes of the book. Um, so, so it's really win-win. Um, so we've got two songs here to try out. But here's the thing, the first one we're going to do is to the tune of Hey Jude. And I had this plan about three months ago that I was going to buy an accordion and I was going to learn to play Hey Jude on it. <laughs> and what I learned is that that's really fucking hard. <laughs> that, that accordions are not that easy to master and Hey Jude is not a tune for beginners. So then I was like, oh God, what are we going to do to keep on the melody? What's the plan here? And, um, and I came up with kazoos. That was, that was what I, I figured we could have a kazoo orchestra at, at every reading. So, so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for three people um, who, who would be willing to join me up front for the kazoo orchestra. Um, and, and all I ask is you have to be somewhat familiar with the melody of Hey Jude 
and Chim Chim Churi, is there anyone out there who feels they meet that description? And let me just add, without looking to see if they're raised hands, if no one were to raise their hands, I would be forced to pick whoever looks the most vulnerable in the crowd <laughs> and the most afraid of being selected, and I guess I would just have to settle for them. So, um, so with that in mind, raise your hands if you'd like to join my kazoo orchestra. Yes, you, you were eager. You come, yep, you right there, you come on up. And you sound like you need some, so you go ahead, sir. Yes, you, you join us. And, and yes, you down there, that would be great. Oh, and you right there, that would be terrific. So come on up. Yeah, you, sir, you, sir, and you, ma'am, come on up. And join me over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're all fresh, fresh kazoos. <laughs> now, let's go ahead and just hear you play some practice notes. Go for it. Go for, not like that, no. Um, the wide end, forward, not, never the narrow end. Okay, go for it. So the wide end, right, the wide end, okay, okay. right. So, oop, oop. Okay, so let's just hear the beginning. Let's just hear you practice wide end. Yep, wide end. Let's just hear you practice the beginning of Hey Jude. Okay. Okay, stop. So, so um, we won't need this. I don't think that will be necessary. Thanks. It was a good idea, good intuition, but it won't be necessary. So, you don't blow, you hum. It's a hum. Awesome. Awesome. Sounded good. Sounded good. Okay. All right, so we're going to go for it. We'll do the first song. And here's how we're going to do it, okay? We'll start with the A, and we'll hold the A, and you guys come in, and as soon as you guys come in, we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and, and sing. And this is work at, at one bookshop out of every four. So our <laughs> odds are excellent. 25%, we're good. Okay, ready? And A, you don't start to cry. If you fry now, it will be shitty. A pity if you turn into a heap. Cause it's my turn to sweep and take out the ashes. A you don't turn to flames. What a shame if you wind up well done. Oh, hey, son, there's no reason to pout. I've got hot dogs. We can have a cookout. Oh, you guys were awesome. You're rock stars. All right, we're on a roll. Let's go for Tim Chimney. Let's hear the melody. Let's just get warmed up. Let's hear the melody. Go. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, awesome. Okay, all right, you got it. That was awesome. Seriously, I've never actually heard anyone pull it off. That was the first time I've ever actually heard Tim Chimney work. They were like, let's do it. Let's do it. Amazing. Um, okay, all right, ready? And one, two. Are we starting on three or after three? After one, two, three, then go, or one, two, go on three? One, two, three, then go. That, okay. One, two, chim chimney, chim chimney, chim chim tree. A sweep is as lucky as lucky can be. Chim chimney, chim chimney, chim chim true. Good luck will rub off when I shake sands with you. Or blow me a kiss, pretty mama. And that's lucky too. Okay, now the musical part. <laughs> we'll stop there. Hey, big hand for the kazoo orchestra. You guys rule. Those kazoos are yours. Go ahead and keep the kazoos. Thanks so much, guys. You're rock stars. That was awesome. You guys were terrific too. Thank you, Mr. Um, right. So when we do the signing, when we do the signing in a little bit, um, if you could bring me back the song sheets. Um, I haven't reached the part of the book tour when I can start giving them away. 
I've done the calculations, and I think that's Phoenix. In Phoenix, I can start to let people keep them. Unfortunately, you guys had the disadvantage of coming too early. So, um, okay, well, great. So, so anyway, I am happy um, uh, to answer any questions about this book, uh, my earlier books, um, relationship advice. <laughs> um, whatever you guys want to talk about, I'm here for you and your needs. So, um, um, ma'am, go ahead. Growing up, did you think that you would do this? Knowing your family history, which is wonderful, right. did you think that you would become an author? Growing up, did I think I would become an author? Well, my first ambition was to do gross-out special effects. Um, when I was... Uh, when I was seven, I I was in a movie, which is like really weird, but it's true. I was I was the little kid who who poked the voodoo doll with the pens and uh, the pins in Creepshow, um, and and this was I was like seven or eight, and I spent a whole week on the on the Creepshow set, um, which was directed by George Romero, and I I mostly stayed in Tom Savini's trailer. Tom Savini did the special effects, and I kind of hid under his work table and watched him make decomposing faces and like monster parts and was he was like a rock star with his leather jacket and his weird pointy <laughs> Spock eyebrows and stuff and he hasn't changed a bit the weird thing about Tom Zavini is he still looks like he's 32 and I know time has passed at least some time has passed <laughs> um, but in any event um, uh, when I was like 12, 13 all my friends like I had friends who were really into sports and they subscribed to Sports Illustrated and I had friends who were into rock and roll, and so they subscribed to Rolling Stone magazine. And I subscribed to Fangoria magazine, yes. which was this, it was this magazine dedicated to the art of the gross-out special effects dudes like, like Tom Savini and Rob Botton and Stan Winston. And, and it had these awesome centerfolds where, like, they were like, I was into the wrong centerfolds at, like, 13. <laughs> like, like, these were always, like, some guy with, like, a spear going in the back of his head and his eye popping out. He's like, ah! You know, I was like, awesome. I'd tape that up. I had a whole wall of them and stuff. Um, um, and, and so I had this ambition to grow up and murder people uh, in creative ways and, and in, you know, have cool monsters like, like eat, bite people in half and stuff. And in fact, that ambition was realized. I just wound up doing it on paper instead of with latex and, and you know, makeup glue. Oh, thank goodness you did it on paper. Because he's going to join yeah, I mean, I think most people in the film industry would agree with you completely based on my, you know, um, anyone who's seen my Halloween makeups knows I didn't have a lot of talent in that, that regard. Folks, let me get to you with the mic so yeah, you can ask right the question so they can hear you he's online. He's wearing an FU shirt, which there I think is a comment on me. <laughs> FIU. Right. Speaking, of, I can speaking of films, what was it like to watch Horns get turned into a movie, especially since it was starring Harry Potter himself? Mm. Right. So my second novel um, is, is about a guy who drinks too much one night, goes out to curse God, and the next morning he wakes up with horns um, um, growing out of his temples. That has actually happened to me at least three times <laughs> in my life. It's a very common drank too much experience. Um, but so this guy inherits all the powers of the devil and uses it to hunt for the person who murdered his girlfriend. It was made into uh, a film a couple years ago starring Daniel Radcliffe as the hero and Juno Temple um, as his beloved. And I love the movie. I mean, I think it's amazing, you know. Um, <clears throat> I think it came out really well. Daniel Radcliffe acted his heart out. He's an actor who can do anything. And, and he proved it in scene after scene, you know, whether it was comedy or heartbreak or, or fury. You know, he always played it beautifully. Juno Temple gave such a brave, strong performance. And, and um, you know, I, I just love them both the pieces. And, and you, know, um, you know, I'm like, like, so I came of age in the grunge era. And one of the things in the grunge era was like musicians would always say stuff like, I don't know how people can dance to that song. I was in so much pain when I wrote it. Yeah. And I, I always kind of hate that as like, you know, how pretentious could you be and stuff. Not the sound like, you know, someone from a band name like Mudlumps or something like that. But, but um, uh, I, uh, I, I was not a terribly happy person when I wrote Horns. Um, you know, I, had, I was recently divorced. I was struggling with paranoia. Um, and I was just a total, you know, total depressed dude. And, and for me, 
And the movie is actually a lot more fun than the book. I, I'm very proud of the book, and I think it is a good time, and, and I encourage you to buy one copy tonight and another copy for a friend. Um, <laughs> but, but, but for me, the film is like, I, I like can watch it, and I don't have any bad feelings, and I'm like, oh, look, movie stars doing my scenes. This is awesome. Um, so, uh, so that's my take on that. I know that uh, um, attitudes about the film are somewhat mixed, that some people e either really love it or you know, some people feel like it's a colossal disappointment. But given how bizarre the material was, it's not a terribly commercial novel, and it's not an obvious, you don't look at the book and go say, wow, this would make a great film. Um, so given the source material they were working with, I think they did about as well as they could. Yeah, you back there. Hey, uh, during the the press for Nosferatu, I read some, in a review, I read some sketch of what a rough time you had with the whole querying process with agents and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm doing that now, and I was hoping if you could just say, like, how many did you query and just riff on what a miserable experience it is? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, um, um, so the elephant in the room is that both my parents write. Um, <laughs> My dad, my dad wrote a book called Finders Keepers, which is a terrific thriller and I think shows tremendous promise. And, you know, I certainly hope, I certainly hope he'll continue with that because he could go places. My mom is also a tremendous novelist, Tabitha King, um, and uh, has written brilliant novels about what it's like to be working class in the state of Maine. Um, my brother, Owen King, is a writer. Um, I know I'm biased, but I thought Double Feature, his novel, was the funniest novel the last 15 years. Just an absolutely hysterical piece of work. His wife, Kelly Braffitt, writes sick and twisted crime novels that I highly recommend. And um, when, I was, um, uh, when I was in college, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I was very insecure, and um, I had this fear that if I wrote under my own name, um, that I might get lousy work published anyway because I had a famous dad um, and I lived in dread of that and, and I, for my own confidence I needed to know when I sold a story that it sold for the right reasons because an editor somewhere loved it and thought readers would love it too. Um, so I dropped my last name and I, I wrote as Joe Hill for about 10 years and I wrote four novels that I was never able to sell. Um, uh, including one book, um, you know, that I spent three years on that I thought, I, I thought, oh, wow, this is a total grand slam. And then it got turned down and by every publisher in New York, every publisher in London, and for an extra kick in the nuts, it was turned down by every publisher in Canada, you know. And um, that was a book called The Fear Tree. And, and so that was a big 800-page George R. R. Martin kind of thing. And... Um, um, but I also wrote a lot of short stories, and while many of them were turned down, I started to sell some to little literary magazines and to British fantasy magazines. Um, eventually, I had what I thought was a huge, a colossal breakthrough. I sold an 11-page Spider-Man story to Marvel Comics, and I thought, I am somebody! Um, eventually, I sold my book of short stories. Um, it was turned down in New York and in London, but I found a small press in England that was willing to take a chance on it and print a thousand copies. Um, and that was sort of my, that was, that was about as far as the pen name got. It didn't get much further than that. Once I started doing appearances for that book, people began to recognize the family resemblance and blog about me and stuff, and I knew it was all going to melt apart. Um, but it was okay. By the time it came apart, by the time the pen name came apart, I had gotten what I needed. I, I had built up some confidence and, and worked my craft and learned, to be, learned some things I desperately needed to learn as a writer um, and got comfortable in my own skin. I felt like I had engineered a voice that worked for me. Um, Bernard Malmed uh, once said that the artist's most difficult creation is his first creation, which is the creation of himself and his own voice. And I think that's, that's really much harder than writing any individual story or novel. Um, I, did, I was turned down by a lot of agents. Um, eventually, I did find an agent, the late Mickey Choate, um, who was my agent for 10 years before he found out anything about my parents, <laughs> um, which was a bit of a mean prank to play on him. But uh, Mickey, Mickey took it in stride. Um, tremendous guy, and, and uh, unfortunately, I, I lost him um, not long after I finished the third draft of The Fireman. Um, so, um, 
But all I can say is, is, is keep writing, and it never happens as soon as you think it should, or, or wish it, or wish it did. It's always, it's, it's always, you know, you finally write a short story or a novel. Where you're like, I did it. I wrote something great. Awesome. You're only about four years away then. <laughs> it'll, it'll probably be the novel after that, or, or, or maybe even the novel after that. But you, you certainly, you know, just all you can do is keep piling up the pages, try to work a little bit at it every day. And remember that no one result, no one day of work matters that much. You know, one rejection slip doesn't matter that much. One lousy day of writing doesn't matter that much. It's stories are built in a steady drip, drip, drip like stalactites. And careers are built the same way. And it just doesn't pay to get too up or too down about, you know, any result in any given week. Yeah, you. Go ahead. Yeah, you in the Nirvana shirt. In, in the Mud Glob shirt. <laughs> My favorite, my favorite grunge band, Mud Globs. No, I love Nirvana. They're, they're Nirvana. fantastic. Um, no, well, talking about the, the kind of the writing process, I was kind of curious, when you approach a, a project, is there a difference between the way you approach something like The Fireman or Horns versus something like when you wrote a script for Spider-Man or for like Lock and Key? Lock and Key, right. Well, so, um, so, so I have this, I have two careers. I have one career as a novelist and another career as a comic book writer. And as I've noted, I was actually a comic book writer first. So, so comic books are my home. Um, uh, I, I love writing novels and I love writing short stories, but nothing is more fun than writing a comic book. Um, and my big project was Lock and Key, which was an ongoing comic that lasted, I wrote for about six years, and it's about a haunted house full of enchanted keys. Every key unlocks a different door and activates a different power. Um, and uh, and was a hell of a lot of fun to write. Um, uh, how do I? But so the question is kind of like, how do I decide? Like, what is? How do I approach a novel as opposed to a comic? Or, um, you know, um, in the case of Lock and Key, I had written a Spider-Man story for Marvel, and I, it wasn't even that good a story. It's probably my worst published piece. But I so loved the act of doing it. I was desperate to do it again, and so I worked up some pitches for different comic book stories and sent them to Marvel. And I remember I had just had my first kid and he was a toddler and he used to get so angry. Like I didn't know that toddlers did that. <laughs> you know, they don't do it in the movies, you know? And, and he would like, he'd be like, Aah! and he'd pick up a plastic truck and, be, and throw it across the room. And I remember thinking, what if that was a real truck? So one of my pitches was Baby Hulk. I just, <laughs> I thought that was a natural and for some reason Marvel, Marvel didn't want it. Um, but I sent them this pitch about the haunted house and the keys, and they passed on it. DC passed on it. I think Dark Horse passed on it, but I didn't pass on it. I kept thinking about it, and I remember I'd, I'd have to go out and get diapers at like 11.30 in the evening, because that's always when you ran out of them. You never <laughs> ran out of them at like the middle of the day. It was always like 11.30 in the evening, you discover you have no diapers left. And I'd go out for a drive to get the diapers, and on the drive back I'd be like half awake, and I'd, I'd think up a new key. And, and so I was writing the story in my head for a long time, and I was always seeing it in terms of panels because it started as this comic book pitch. Um, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question at all because I don't really know how I decide what's a comic or what's not. That was obviously a comic. Um, oh, you know, okay, so I did a comic book called Wraith that's a spinoff of Nosferatu. Thanks so much. The, the, um, part of the reason I did it was because I wanted to tell the origin story of Charlie Manx, and it didn't work when it was part of the novel. It just slowed the novel down. It was like, you know, the book is like Jaws, and, and then Charlie Manx's origin story was like finding out how Jaws was born, and how there was like, he was like, his mom was mean to him and didn't care, and there was like, you know, 160 other little great whites swimming around, and he couldn't get any attention. It's like, no one cares. Now I don't hear that. They just like when the shark is big and eating people. Um, but when I did it as a comic, it worked. When I did, for some reason, when I redesigned that whole interlude as a comic book, it was really fun. And then I thought up this other story, which is basically Con Air and Christmas Land. Um, <laughs> and so I did that, and it was just a comic. So I don't know exactly how something becomes a comic. I still don't know. If I figure it out, I'll, I'll post something about it someday. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your comic uh, stuff. Yeah. Question for you is: Where did you make the change from comics to novels? Right. Um, where did I make the change from comics to novels? So I was writing comics and stuff, and and uh, you know I remember I remember I had had this book that I spent all the time on that got turned down everywhere. Um, not long after that, 
I, I decided I probably wasn't going to try another novel. Um, I felt like I had taken my shot, and I maybe didn't have a novel in me. Um, but then, I, I, out of the blue, I got this acceptance from Marvel Comics, and I thought, and I remember thinking, I, this tremendous sense of peace came over me. I remember thinking, I'm going to go back to school, I'm going to get my education certificate, I'm going to teach English, and I'm going to write comics. And that'll be awesome. That's like, it doesn't matter if I didn't get to write novels. If I get to write, you know, Ghost Rider, I'll be totally stoked. I can make stuff up and write about a guy on a bike with a flaming skull for a head. It'd be awesome. Um, but then I also had a bunch of short stories I had written that I was very proud of, and I had this idea maybe I could sell a collection and at least have a book that way. Um, the, um, and I did find a publisher, and at the time I had 13 stories for it, and I wrote a 14th and a 15th to go into it. And then I thought, boy, if there was one more good story, that would be great. And so I started writing a short story about a guy who buys a ghost online. And I thought, this is great. I, I thought, this is great. This guy is going to buy this ghost, and it's going to come, and he's going to realize it's real, and it's going to be too late, and he's such a jerk, it won't matter, and he'll get eaten, eaten for breakfast by page 30, and boom, I'll have a short story. And it, the, my plan would have worked. It would have worked. But, but the hero of the story, Judas Coyne, refused to die on my schedule. Um, I, I tried to kill him on page 30, and the son of a bitch kept breathing. And, and gradually... You know, and I just threw everything I had at him, and he wouldn't fall down. And gradually, I started to think maybe he wasn't as big a jerk as I thought he was initially. Initially, I thought he was a real bastard. But gradually, I began to see that under the surface, there was a really decent man there who was full of regret and full of anger. And I got curious about what all that anger was about. Why? Why was this tremendously successful rock and roll star who had played stadiums and had this huge career, what did he have to be angry about? What was he mad about? And it took me 350 pages to find out. And that wound up being a novel, and that's how I became a novelist. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, you may have started to answer this already. Um, when you sit down to write a novel, do you have a big outline with a lot of details in it, or just have some characters and a, a vague idea of the end, and you, you kind of see what happens? I, I give you my view on outlines. Um, Let's see. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there's a thing in here. They get talking. John Rookwood and Harper get drunk one night, and they talk about lots of different subjects. The Beatles Stones comes up. I'm a British invasion guy, and my Beatles Stones fixation is turned up in every single one of these books. Um, she, yeah, at one point, John Rookwood, he has an English accent. There isn't anyone English here, is it? Is there? No one English? Bloody hell no. <laughs> Good one. I've been avoiding when I read. I, I've done a couple sections online, and I always avoid reading John's dialogue because I don't have a good, a good English accent, you know, and he's the fireman is English. And the, um, the uh, you know, I've been asked, like, if there was a film, who would I want to play him? And I, I think it's obvious it would be great to have that, that superb Englishman, Dick Van Dyke, you know, playing someone who can deliver an authentic sense of what it means to be British. But anyway, uh, John says at one point, he's been drinking a bit, and he says, any writer who works by outline should be burned at the stake, possibly with their own outline and note cards used as kindling. So that's how I feel about outlines. Um, that was, and that's maybe the one place in the book where John's sounding a little bit less like he's British and a little bit more like he's a writer dude from New Hampshire. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Are you working on a show or movie for Lock and Key? Uh, am I working on a show or movie for Lock and Key? And the answer is yes. The, um, so Lock and Key, Lock and Key uh, was filmed as a $10 million pilot for a TV series by Fox. And, and it came out amazing. It looked like early period Spielberg. It was very scary. It was tremendously exciting. And it's now entering its third hit season in my imagination. But, <laughs> but, in, but in real life, Fox, uh, Fox passed on it. And it never got on the air. They went instead with that big hit show, Alcatraz. Um, and, uh, and we wound up with no lock and key show. Um, that was five years ago, and the landscape has changed in the time since. 
Um, not only has Walking Dead continued to be a monster hit, and that was adapted from a comic, AMC is now adapting Preacher. There have been several other comics that have made the leap to the small screen very successfully. Um, and, and although it's not based on a comic, American Horror Story has proved you can scare people week after week and they'll come back for it. And just think if you like the characters. Like, how great would American Horror Story be if you didn't just wish everyone would die every single episode? <laughs> you know? And so with, with some characters you could love, it could be really fun. Um, so uh, we're taking another swat at it. Uh, uh, IDW Publishing has uh, already got two TV sh shows going. Um, one uh, is uh, Winona Earp, which is on Sci-Fi, and and people seem to be digging that. Um, there's they're going to do with BBC America uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, which is a spinoff of a Douglas Adams novel, and that that's going to be cool. Um, and so Lock and Key is going to be the next one, and I'm writing the pilot right now. Not you, sir, but the one behind you. Yes, you. I play a kazoo, and I'm, I'm on my solo tour right now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the Tales from the Dark Side book that you have coming out. That's, I love that show so much as a kid. So I'm right. To to He's wondering about the Tales from the Dark Side, my experience with Tales from the Dark Side. So, um, right, Tales from the Dark Side was a show in the 1980s. Um, uh, it was sort of my generation's t uh, Twilight Zone or Outer Limits. Um, loved it. I was hired by CBS to reinvent it um, for a modern audience. And so I wrote them uh, not one, but three scripts and a Bible for the first three seasons. Because I was doing the original Tales from the Dark Side with a twist. I had, I had an idea that would link the stories oh. so that they didn't just stand in isolation to each other. That's now entering its second hit season <laughs> in my imagination. But in real life, CBS passed on it. Um, you know, you know, and it tested really well, and people liked it. This is sort of hard to hear. I, I mean, I'm not that bothered. That I was paid well for my time. Um, the the truth is, is getting a TV show on the air is the hardest thing in entertainment, except maybe for launching a Broadway musical. Um, the success fail rate is it, the fail rate is you know a thousand failures for everything that gets on TV, and most of what gets on TV doesn't last there very long, so it's very difficult to, to pull the trick off. Fortunately, I have these great allies in IDW Comics um, who have a terrific relationship with the various television channels and so on. They won the rights back to the screenplays to do it as a comic book. Gabriel Rodriguez, my collaborator and one of my best friends, is drawing it, and that's going to be a series starting this summer, and we'll get a chance to see um, what the show could have been. And there's even a talk, they're based, the initial run is going to be based on my screenplays. Um, but there's even talk that if it's successful, they'll keep it going. And I've, I've, heard, I've heard them toss around some really cool names of various writers to work on a continuing series. So that could happen. Yay. Maybe one or two others. One more. You have one. Go ahead. Will there ever be a, a sequel to Nosferatu? Um, <clears throat> Nosferatu is also being developed as a TV show by AMC. Um, if there is a sequel, it, their, their plan right now, without giving away too many details, is to essentially make the first season the book. So you'd get the whole, you'd get a 12 episode series that would be the book and a couple bonus elements. Some stuff that I didn't go into in the story. Um, if that succeeded, I've explained to them what the second season would be and how that would operate as an official sequel to the book. Um, so there might be a sequel, but if there's a sequel, it would only be in the context of a TV show, I think. I've done a lot of exploring in that world. I mean, I'd never say never, because um, if you haven't read the book, you might want to be like, ah, nah, 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 for a second, because there's going to be a little bit of spoilers, just a little bit. Those kids from Christmas Land are still out there. Yeah. 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 So, so it's always possible. Um, I've, I have to say, uh, without any spoilers, that The Fireman is one of the first things I've ever worked on in my life where I got done and I thought, hmm, I could see myself coming back to visit some of these characters in, you know, somewhere between the next five to ten years. That could, that could, there could be another one. Um, go ahead, sir. You got another one? Quick question. Sure. Gunpowder. No bullshit. Gunpowder. Go back or not. Okay. So, um, so in 2000, this is a deep cut. Um, in 2007, I wrote a novella that was published by PS Publishing called Gunpowder. It's a science fiction thing, the elevator pitches, it's sort of Lord of the Flies um, in outer space. 
it's like these 30 boys are all, they're all sort of psychically engineering a planet. They're on a planet, they're trying to make it come to life, and they're, they, they themselves are not really normal children and can do amazing things. Um, they all get stranded there. They're sort of cut off from everyone else and, and uh, split into factions, and it becomes a war. Um, the first, the first, that novella was published in 2007 in a very limited edition. Very few people have had a chance to read it. I, I promised, I see a couple people have, I always, I, like, for years I've been saying I'm going to write the second novella in the series, that is, which is called Slave Girls of Gunpowder. That's actually sort of a joke. This, the girls in question are, are actually nobody's slave girls, but, but in any event, I've had this, I've had this idea for the second one. Um, now I'm going to have to write it and two other novellas uh, uh, um, beside because I kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And so when I made my last contract with William Morrow, I had it written into the contract that I have to do gunpowder. So my next book, which hopefully will be out next year, is a book of four short novels, and that's called Strange Weather. And then the book after that will be Gunpowder, hopefully by 2018, 2019. So Will that be by PS or will that be... Will okay, so PS Publishing did the limited editions. If possible, PS will probably do each of the other parts as little hardcover chapbooks, possibly, but I can't promise. You have a question related? Go ahead. Um, it's kind of a personal question. Are you happy with the way that all the P's have turned out by Skeleton Crew? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I love them. And I yeah. Want to know you uh, all the keys in, in um, lock and key uh, have been made um, into, uh, their, you can buy them from Skeleton Crew Studios in Maine. They do amazing craftsmanship. They're really great. I am not to blame if they unlock any doors and have un, unforeseen <laughs> consequences. That's not on me, so it's buyer beware. I, I was going to wrap things up, but I see there's a couple more. Go ahead, ma'am. It's another personal question. You like Bur uh, boxers. Okay, no, go ahead. Do you like ghosts? Do you like horror and all that scary stuff? Do you believe in ghosts now that you're adult? Do I believe in ghosts? I believe in information theory, and information theory says that, that information cannot be erased. It can only be transmuted into another form, just like energy, which seems to me to be a pretty good argument for the human spirit. Go ahead. One of my favorite things in your novels is the inscapes. Yeah. I'm really in love with that, and I noticed that there was a Pennywise Circus yes. in that. And I'm wondering how, if we'll be continuing to uh, explore more of the inscapes in your novels. Um, there was one of the inscapes. So inscapes are these imaginary worlds that have been so intensely imagined they've become real, and you can actually sort of bump into them. You can wander into them under the right circumstances. Um, uh, Pennywise Circus, that, that copyright belongs to someone else, so I won't be going to that inscape. Um, however, uh, it's always possible I'll write about Orphan Henge because I've had a whole book about Orphan Henge in my head, and that's also on the map. Um, I don't want to take up too much of people's time because I want to, be, but there are questions, and I also don't want people to feel neglected. Go ahead. Neither do I. <laughs> There's a short story at the end of 20th Century Ghost called My Father's Mask. Um, if you like that story, um, there's a, a woman named Kelly Link, and that's like every story she writes, only better. Um, when I wrote My Father's Mask, I was trying to write a Kelly Link story, so I did my best. Um, but if you like that kind of thing, uh, uh, Kelly, one of, maybe my favorite story by her is um, The Specialist Hat. And I'd recommend that. Or another short story of hers is, um, I think it's The Fairy Handbag. Um, but and she's just tremendous. And, and if you like these kind of short stories that feel like reality is getting tipped upside down and you don't, you sense it all fits together, but you don't completely see how, that's her, that's her, uh, that's her jam. Go ahead. Based on real people or inspired by real people? There's a uh, are any of are any of my characters based on real people? There is um, not. Re I don't do autobiographical stuff. Um, I mean, there is. There's no. Uh, there's a um, like for example in the Fireman, there is this guy uh, named Jacob who is uh, this hideously pretentious 
writer who's a narcissist and loves to hear himself talk. And like, if he was like at this Q and A, he'd never let it end. And you know, so like, I wouldn't know where that came from or anything. And and um, um, I don't really, I don't actually find it all that interesting to write about people I know. For me, books come alive and short stories come alive when a character is a mystery when I don't really know what, what, what their deal is, and then I can use the story to find out. Um, in the case of the firemen, you know, I've, um, strange to say, I've never been pregnant. Um, the lead character is a pregnant woman, and I've always wondered what that would be like to have your biology hijacked by another living creature. Um, and also in the story, there's this stuff, this dragon scale that you get on you, and that's alive too, and it's hijacking people's system and, and piggybacking on them. And, and I saw the two things as being alike. You know, this woman's, this woman's body becomes a landscape that's a war between two different kinds of life. And I thought that was interesting to explore. I've never experienced anything like that. I haven't had athlete's foot since I was 11. I mean, you know, I, so, um, but in the context of the book, I could imagine my way into it and that was very refreshing. So, hey, um, uh, I just think, I just think, uh, readers in Coral Gables are so lucky that they have books and books to go to. Um, yes. This is this is one of the I I go to a lot of bookstores. This is one of the most beautiful and most lovingly curated uh, uh, bookstores in all of America. Um, you can't do better than that. And please remember to support this place. They're so wonderful to have me. You guys were wonderful. I'm going to sit over here and sign some books. Thank nice you. Show. Folks, very quickly, you're watching online, give us a call. Uh, thanks to our guest introducer, Aaron Curtis. All of the Joe's books are behind the counter. Give us a call, we'll get one signed. If as you rise, you can fold your chairs, lean them against the back, we'll have plenty of room for Joe to sign. Books are for sale out there. Stick around, we got some music coming up for you outside. Thank you so much for coming.